Now let's keep this a scandal between you and you and me. This must be kept out of history. Not a soul must know. Nobody, I swear, not a soul. We were planning not even to tell your majesty. Welcome to Season 2 of How Would Lubitsch Do It? A podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's December 1920, and today, Paul Cuff joins us to discuss Anna Bullen. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, or just to say hi. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Paul Cuff. Paul, I have two questions for you, as usual, for our guests. First, who are you? What do you do? And second, why are you uh, hopping on, especially this specific episode? And we're in the middle of Lubitsch's later Berlin period. He's just hit it big, or actually he's about to right after this film is made. And so we're kind of still in that highly obscure area of his career. How did you get to know Lubitsch? And what inspired you to want to hop on the most esoteric film podcast in existence, I'm convinced? <laughs> so, uh, yes, I am Paul Cuff. I am some species of film historian. My general specialism is silent cinema, and my specialism within a specialism is the work of Ebbo Gols, and my specialism within my specialism within my specialism is Napoleon. Napoleon vu par Abel Gols. Gols is originally a 10-hour film about Napoleon. And how I got to Lubitsch and indeed on this podcast was, firstly, I like obscure things. Napoleon was itself exceedingly obscure for a long time, and that is part of it. Well, it is still part of its appeal. And the man responsible probably for getting me towards a Lubitsch actually has been on this podcast before, Jose Arroyo. Mm. When I was studying film at the University of Warwick in the UK, he gave a lecture on Trouble in Paradise in, I think it was our third year. And I'd never seen anything quite like it. And I thought, this is astonishing. And I think I had possibly seen to be or not to be on television years before, but was not at an age or intellectual capacity at that point in my life to appreciate what an extraordinary film it was. Around this time, I saw Napoleon for the first time. And so I naturally wanted to expand my knowledge of silent cinema. And one of the ways I did that was to investigate as many of the copies of the Thames Silence series as it was in the 1980s. So this is the series that Kevin Branlow, David Gill, and later um, Patrick Stanbury made of restorations of silent films. And so at some point in my obsessive collecting of obscure American VHS and laser discs, I'd never handled a laser disc before, and it was the greatest privilege and horror of my life to discover how laser discs work and how to transfer them to DVD and <laughs> all the kind of technical madness just to see the student prints of old Heidelberg <laughs> in any kind of quality that wasn't appalling. And so I sat and watched my, I was about to say my little laser disc, my massive laser disc, possibly even a quadruple laser disc set. It came with the 1954 film version of the student prints with the voice of Mario Lanza, but not the body. Anyway, so I watched The Student Principal Heidelberg, and I thought, this is fantastic. And I kind of thought, well, clearly I need to see more early Lubitsch, because this is really interesting. By this point, I'd kind of seen some of his sound films, and I thought, you know, this is clearly a genius. How did he start? And again, the fact that these films were obscure and difficult to see was part of the appeal. Mm -hmm. And so I eventually kind of wormed my way through the internet <laughs> and found early things. And I can say one of the great pleasures of teaching at work was that I ended up kind of teaching with Jose on a module which to be or not to be was part of so i had the pleasure of seeing him lecture about to be or not to be and again kind of he's responsible in a great part for my appreciation of lubitsch and enthusiasm for him and i think to answer the sub part of your question about why anna berlin <laughs> <laughs> it's because i remembered liking it because <laughs> it was part of both the old and the new re-released sets of lubitsch and berlin and when the DVDs came out, I kind of watched them all and I had mixed opinions about the films. I mean, they're a fascinatingly curious and varied bunch of films. And I think my favorite, or the one that stayed in my memory the most, was probably The Wildcat, because mm -hmm. it's the most unbelievably exuberant film. I mean, at one point, I taught a Silent Lubitsch on a silent cinema module I was teaching. I had The Wildcats paired with Student Prince of Old Heidelberg as the week's double bill, <laughs> just because they're sort of strange and interesting bedfellows. Anna Boleyn, I had memories of it being <laughs> the better of the kind of historical themed or the fantasy themed films on that set. And I have to say, having rewatched it again in absolutely beautiful visual quality on the Blu-ray again for this podcast, 
the things that I remembered about it were still there. Mm -hmm. Emil Yannings was still there. Emil Yannings was still Emil Yannings. And I remember the facial expressions and the eyebrow and the kind of bulging cheeks. And <laughs> I remember him having an absolutely fantastic time playing Henry VIII. And then I sort of refreshed my memory as I went along and said, oh, yes, I remember I lost interest in the film about halfway through and it <laughs> still has the same effect. It's half a good film mm -hmm. or it's half an interesting film where it's sort of like a very dangerous sex comedy for an hour of people negotiating relationships with each other. And I rewatched also Madame de Barry for this, just to refresh my memory of that. And I had exactly the same problems with that, watching that again. The first half of that film, where things are being set up, are kind of interesting. And then at a certain point, you realize it has nothing else to say or do. I think Carmen, too, has that. Yeah. I feel like Lubitsch is much more at home with the comedy before the tragedy. Yes, exactly. The playfulness before things have to get serious because the necessity of the story is telling. Yeah, absolutely. A few months ago, it's been a long time on my wish list, or I should buy this, is the German Blu-ray of Love of the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And finally it arrived. I realized I'd left it several years. This has been on my wish list to buy, because you have to buy it direct from the people who manufactured it and did the digital restoration. It's one of the regrets of my life that I did not buy that film this ah. summer when I was in the Berlin Film Museum, which had it. And ah. now getting it in Canada is a little bit of a chore. <laughs> Again, I can send you a version of that if you're in any way lacking of it. Oh, I do have a version. I'm trying to collect any good Lubitsch Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. So next time I'm in Berlin, I'll just stop by the Cinematheque and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> As a physical object, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. And it's got Emil Yennings' massive face on the cover. And I watched this thinking I was so excited when the Blu-ray kind of finally came because the one man sending it out was on holiday when I first sent in the order and it disappeared. I didn't hear anything for months. And I thought, oh my God, I've left it too long. This company ceased to exist. I've just lost my money. <laughs> but it arrived and I thought, oh, great, we'll both sit down. We'll watch this, you know, a real orchestral score, beautiful image quality. And we watched it. And I realized quite early on it was dead behind the eyes. Mm. I thought this looks stunning. This sounds even better. The original orchestral score is sumptuous, beautiful, gorgeous. What you can do with a massive orchestra circa 1920 from a really wonderful tunesmith who's an operetta composer, Edward Koenigke, the composer. And it was the single most impressive Lubitsch film I'd ever seen in terms of scale and budget. And you could taste the money on the walls of this. It was just, <laughs> just ludicrous. You can taste the hyperinflation. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And particularly with the crowds, people kind of swarming desperate for, for whatever money they could get. Yeah. So I saw The Loves of the Pharaoh, and I thought, okay, well, that was the summit of his German work in terms of budget and everything else before he went to Hollywood. And it's possibly the film of his that I've least enjoyed, that I was most irritated by, thinking mm. there's nothing there. I know it looks fabulous, it sounds fabulous, but it has no soul, it has no heart, it has no Lubitsch. And that was a real immense disappointment. Mm. So coming to Anne Boleyn, I hoped it was better at least than Loves the Pharaoh. And I think it is. I think because it has more history and reality to hang its characters off, it has kind of more heft to it. One of the benefits of Anna Boleyn is the fact that it has a real, well, real historical characters at the heart of it, whereas Love to the Pharaoh do not. And I think that makes a real difference to particularly how we can have come to the film, because even if we don't have much historical knowledge, we know that Henry VIII killed some of his wives, so there's a good chance this may be one of them. And I have to say that Anne Boleyn's story is probably kind of the most famous one. She was the first wife to be to be killed by him. And she kind of epitomizes the fact that he kind of starts to become Bluebeard in historical reality. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that we have this sense of historical doom hanging over the story helps. And even just the fact that the film has more to work with, it has more heft just for the fact that these are real people and absolutely nothing in Lives of the Pharaoh suggests that any of the characters are real. <laughs> Yeah. None of them kind of has a soul. It's kind of it's it's all just kind of gesture. Whereas at least the basis of Anna Boleyn has a bit more to it. And I think that's a real benefit. I would still not go as far as to say that it's a fully involving, emotionally complex film. Again, much as with Madame de Barry, I think when you're halfway through you realise it has nothing new left to say because everything is in place and now everything will simply kind of play out according to the historical fact book and Lubitsch doesn't really do much with what is there. Mm -hmm. Everything is as it should be. And that's the problem. Nothing is more than simply as it should be. Everything looks good. Everything happens as it should do. Everything is in order in this film, but that's not enough. You need more than that to make it a great film, an emotionally <sighs> complex, engaging film, I think. And it's just, it's not there. I'll kind of format this as a slight apology for Loves of the Pharaoh. <laughs> 
because I think this does get at all the complexities of how we should approach, especially films from, you know, in this case, 103 now years ago, right? Where I'm finding that for what we might call lesser films, I mean, you watch The Doll and it's lovely. You're taken along with it because it's a great movie. But Mm. what if the movie's not great? Yeah. What if the movie isn't some shiny example of film art? Well, there's so many ways to find one's way in, right? Mm where you're describing one way in as, you know, the history of the diegetic reality, right? Yeah. Yeah, Henry VIII is a fascinating king. It is pretty cool to watch uh, him form the Anglican Church (laughs) in a fit of rage. Yeah. And for me, though, this film, Sumeroon and Madame du Barry, are the three I've struggled with most because I've had the hardest time finding my way in where I think I would say Loves of the Pharaoh is a lesser film than all three of these. It's not Mm -hmm. as good as any of these. Loves of the Pharaoh is not good. but. At the same time, it has a novelty in Lubitsch's career that took me along with it of, whoa, this is something completely different than the body comedies. Yeah. So there's that. But for this film and Sumeroon, I think I hit a low point for my enthusiasm <laughs> for these films because I watched them both in one night. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it was not a good decision. But I think, moreover, it's that I've seen Lubitsch do what he does in this film in Madame du Barry, and I think this is probably a superior film. Mm. But... What I've landed on for why I struggle with these and why maybe I don't struggle with Loves the Pharaoh is that these are all fundamentally serious movies. Mm. Anna Boleyn and Madame Duberry especially. Yeah. And Loves the Pharaoh is fundamentally unserious in my opinion. <laughs> it is a very silly, goofy movie. Yeah. And at that point, I'm switching to almost my camp brain. Yeah. To me, I love Yannings in that movie because he is so shamelessly mugging. I mean, when he comes <laughs> back from the dead and his hair and makeup are just, they've gone to town on it and he's this golem. Yeah. I was enjoying myself fully in a way that I never could. <laughs> Basically, it's like the 1921 equivalent of a trashy B movie, right? Yeah. Except with a huge budget. It's like watching a bad blockbuster. <laughs> I loved it on that level where every moment I was like, can you believe this shit that's going on? <laughs> like the IFA studios and it's his first dark studio film, which means it's fascinating on a cinematography history level. So that was my way into it. Mm. I didn't really have an equivalent way into Anna Bullen. Therefore, I struggled a bit more. Yeah. When the Pharaoh comes back from the dead at the end, I was thinking, well, this is actually kind of something that Yannings will do in two infinitely greater films, namely The Let's Demand The Last Laugh, the Murnau film from 1924. Mm-hmm where he will play a man who is sort of systematically destroyed and his whole life is taken away from him. So he starts off as this fabulously big, puffed out hotel receptionist, he's a doorman, he's on the door, and ends the film, or nearly ends the film, on his hands and knees scrubbing out urinals. <laughs> and you watch his body transform over the film and it's a towering, brilliant performance. And similarly in von Sternberg's The Last Command from 28, where again, it's the fall of a once great man. And it's Yannings being able to go through the whole range of greatness to deranged actor hallucinating that he's his old self again. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a nice sort of hint of that in Love to the Pharaoh. I agree, there is more than enough in that film in its ludicrous scale to give you something. I will temper my opinion of it. (laughs) I have to say, I also rewatched Summeron as well. And that, I think, was the most disappointing. Yeah. It was, I remember, when I first saw it, and it's still the most disappointing in that group, on the, particularly on that box set, when you dutifully go through all of them and you think, oh, this is not great. This is just a series of sort of moderately interesting illustrated pictures. That film really does have enough going for it. Anna Boleyn and Love of the Fair are better than that. They have more to them than that, at least. In very different ways, yeah. Yeah. I think Anna Boleyn also suffers. I mean, there's a reason why the biopic is still such a genre that we thumb our nose at just a little. Yeah. <laughs> because by necessity, it's this very episodic thing. I think the first shot of the film is actually both my favorite shot of the film. And I think very emblematic of why I struggle with it. I guess it's the second shot of the film, sorry, where Henny Porton playing Boleyn is bobbing in and out of the frame. And it's lovely as a character in show because it frames her as a character who is acted upon mm. by outside forces, right? Yeah. She's not bobbing. Her boat is bobbing and she is being carried along with it. And that's her character. It's a beautiful poetic shot. And unfortunately, that's her character. Absolutely. And I realized when I was re-watching that again, of course, it's also toying with the idea of her being decapitated. Ah, It's a really brilliant, I mean, it's brilliant anyway, as this startling close up, this head merging into the frame and out again. But it's also giving us the shot that we don't get at the end, because we don't get to see her beheaded at the end. I say that as if that's the payoff of the film. Yeah. You know, we don't have to see the beheading. 
which we do get in Madame du Berry. Boy, do we get it. Oh, my <laughs> word, yes. That's possibly another reason why maybe Lubitsch didn't want to do two beheadings, the head being tossed to the crowd or whatever at the end. You've done your one gruesome beheading. Now let's do a kind of off-screen beheading. But yes, that is absolutely the wittiest shot in that film. It's so clever, and as you say, it suggests so many things, and it's lovely. But again, Anna's character has nowhere to go, really. Mm -hmm. Wants all the possibilities of, well, will she marry the man she likes, or will she go down the route of being forced into a marriage? Once that's all been arranged, there's nothing more for her character to do. I feel sorry for Henny Porton, the actress. Yeah. Because... Having watched her in... Cole Heisel's Daughters? Cole Heisel's Daughters, thank you. She's great in that. Which is fantastic. And she gets to play two identical, well, not identical sisters, but she makes them both sisters look so different. Mm -hmm. And the fact that even one of those characters, the woman that no one wants to marry, the sister who's scrubbing the stables and milking the cows, even that character goes through a phenomenal transformation at the end. You think, my God, this is brilliant. And she doesn't get to do anything more than look afraid and a bit sad mm. in Anna Boleyn. You think clearly she was a much better actress if she had a different script, if it was a different genre, or if, you know, Lubitsch did more with the historical setup, she would be able to show off more. But it's just, you know, and particularly when she's opposite Emil Jannings, who's having the time of his life hamming it up mm. in Emil Jannings' way as Henry VIII. It's a thankless role, really, with this script. Also because the film does not wish to make Anna Boleyn more interesting by making her more politically savvy and more manipulative in the way that many other film and television versions of this story have done. So it's a shame that the film is deliberately not letting her be more interesting as a character. The performance, it doesn't have that much to do. I mean, she does it very well, but it's such a limited range that she is given to operate within. Mm -hmm. And her character as a result is way more consistent than, say, Madame Dubarry. Mm. Jeanne Dubarry in that is all over the place. You know, she's a <laughs> babe in the woods at one point and then a tyrant at the next scene. And yeah. But at the same time, I kind of miss that because in that movie, at least, there's so much chest breathing acting <laughs> from both Henny Porton and Paula Negri. But at least when Paula Negri does it, she gets to do chest breathing where people are hyperventilating, that kind of pantomime performance. At least she gets to do it not only out of fear and terror, which is all Henny Porton gets to do in this, but she gets to do it out of occasionally some sort of erotic excitement. Yeah. So there's at least bandwidth there. Absolutely. Because even the fact that Anna Blin has a lover at the start there's no real eroticism about their relationship. No. It's all very chaste and uh, it's kind of strange the film places so much limits on itself in what it's doing. I mean, Emil Jennings is the only person who is having fun on set and in the script and everyone else is just waiting for things to happen. And the trouble is we also know what happens anyway, so it's not as if the waiting is particularly suspenseful given that we know how it ends from the outset. And, you know, I was thinking... Uh, one of the things that I decided, okay, I'll go back and re-experience, was Donizetti's opera Anna Boleyn from 1830-ish, I think. Hmm. And, you know, it's a fabulous opera. It's an Italian reimagining. The Earl of Leicester, you get to hear him pronounce as Le Cesta, as they sing. It's a fabulously strange romantic vision of this period of history. <laughs> but I was thinking, okay, well, here you have the exact same story, the exact same characters, and what is different about this? Why is the opera moving and successful when it's essentially the same mechanism in the opera as well? And I think this is a result of lots of 19th century, early 20th century histories writing Anna Boleyn as the innocent victim. She had no control over her fate. She wasn't being manipulative to make herself queen and so forth. So again, the opera is very much her as victim. But she gets a mad scene at the end. <laughs> And the last 20 minutes of the opera are extraordinary because she's hallucinating that the festivities outside are her wedding day when she's about to be executed. And it's a, such a brilliant dramatic device because the crowd are outside, she's in a prison cell, and the crowd are celebrating the marriage of Henry to Jane, who is the next queen in line. And she's being executed at the very same time that Henry is remarrying. And that is historically false. That did not happen. You know, even Henry VIII mm. waited a little bit before remarrying, not literally as Anna's head rolls. But she's given this fantastic 10, 15 minutes of unbelievable coloratura singing where she's just bursting with song, hallucinating that it's her wedding day, when in fact she's being led to her death. It's amazing. And I don't know how you could make an equivalent of that in this film. It kind of needs it. <laughs> exactly. And you're thinking, well, the film is called Anna Boleyn, not Henry VIII. She needs a big scene at some point, probably near the end, when instead she seems to get almost meeker and meeker as the film goes on. Mm -hmm. 
And I was thinking about this in particular because I was remembering there's a piece by the British scholar, and he died sadly young, called Andrew Britton. And he wrote a lot about particularly kind of classical Hollywood cinema. And in one piece he wrote, and I think it was on the idea of the woman's film, and this was particularly in the 40s, but he also makes reference back to earlier actresses who were given melodramatic roles, which enabled them to show off to make them the absolute centre of the film. And so he mentions, for example, Lillian Gish in Griffith's Broken Blossoms from 1919. And at the climax of that film, Lillian Gish is trapped in a closet and her drunken, alcoholic, brutish, appalling box of violent father is axing his way through the door to give her a damn good whipping. Mm-hmm. And Lillian Gish gives the most terrifying performance of animal fear. She's twirling around, screaming in this tiny little space. is really extraordinary. And Andrew Bitten says that is the equivalent of a mad scene in opera. Mm. That is literally the equivalent of your big aria at the end of the opera, show off. Here you are. You are the kind of absolute emotional highlight center of this film. And that's the kind of thing that Anna Boleyn does not have Mm -hmm. for Lubitsch. The film absolutely denies a big send-off, a moment where you could get the visual equivalent of an aria, the visual equivalent of a mad scene on the operatic stage. And Britain also mentions later films, particularly with Greta Garbo in The Woman of Affairs and things, the moments where the whole drama hinges on this one scene where it's the actress, very often in close-up, just acting solidly before the camera. There's nothing else. Your entire attention is on her. It's it's her performance, it's her face, it's her body. Everything is embodied by her. And again, that is what this film does not have. Henny Porton, excellent though she is in the film, she does nothing wrong, but she's given strict limits as to what she can possibly do. The script does not give her a mad scene. Mm-hmm. One thing I did admire about it is the coldness of the ending. The fact that you don't see her executed. It's quite a chilling way to end it where she's just being led off. But there were two shots. I mean, the one person you do see killed, not quite on screen, but you see the lead up is Smeaton. Mm -hmm. And so Smeaton has been hoist by his own petard effectively at the end because he's essentially schemed to get Henry VIII to suspect Anna Boleyn, but he himself has designs on Anna. So he is dragged away from the court where Anna is being trialed and essentially he's guaranteed that he will be tortured and probably executed. And there's a shot, it's kind of a long shot, looking down a dark hall and Smeaton is being dragged across the floor and at the end, this arched gateway opens and inside is this beautifully lit torture chamber. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best shots in the film and it's for a sidekick character and it's right at the end. You think, oh, there needs to be more shots like this. It needs to be more terrifying. And then he disappears and the doors close and you don't see the torture. And then similarly, when Anna, right at the end of the film, is saying, this is all lies, let Smeaton make his confession before me. And then Norfolk throws open the door and in the background you see Smeaton hanging. Mm -hmm. And again, fantastic, you know, lovely deep staging, lovely lighting, lovely composition, everything. You think, this is great. Where has this been for the last hour and a half? You need more moments like this. And I think there's glimpses of, okay, these are really, and I suppose you can also say that these things would also work on stage. I mean, of course, they're cinematic. They're in a film and you can do things with the lighting and everything. But nevertheless, they're nothing that could not be done on the stage. And it made me think by the end of the film, well, much of the film is a really beautifully produced, you know, on a big opera stage, for example. You could get stuff like this. You could get extras. You get exteriors like this. But you don't have the emotional equivalent of the music, of the singing, to give you that extra dimension to it. Mm-hmm. And even the visual equivalent of the mass, you know, like the climax in Broken Blossoms, for example, you don't get that. And that's what you need if you do not have the advantages of it being an opera. And I should also say as well, on that note, I think it's just a piano score on the Blu-ray and DVD. Yeah. This film needs more than a piano. Just look how big it is. You can't be that big and engaging. I do wonder about that. If it had a Madame du Barry level score, Mm. I should rephrase, if it had a score on par with the one that the Masters of Cinema release of Madame du Barry has... (laughs) Yes. Then I wonder whether I might have been more taken along by the film on anything other than an academic level. I also thought, well, maybe I've done this in injustice, given how big an impact music can have. Again, I mean, in the case of Love to the Pharaoh, the music was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And only this afternoon I was listening, thanks to that film, Koenig's greatest hit, Die Wette aus Dingstar, the cousin from somewhere or other. It's an untranslatable word, Dingstar. He was a really fantastic composer. I love the music for the film, Mm -hmm. but I still didn't like the film. So I think music can only go so far in convincing you that what you're watching is better than it is. But absolutely, I agree. That's my exact reaction to Madame du Barry, which has one of the better scores I've heard. Absolutely. You think, okay, well, it would give the film a bit more something. Mm -hmm. (sighs) 
it would give it a bit more heft. But again, there's only so far you can go if there's something fundamentally not there to engage with. Music works best when it's got something to work with. Yeah. Particularly when you see something live with live musicians and with a crowd, and you think there is nothing like that in anything outside silent cinema when you're sat there watching these images and with an orchestra playing a fantastic score. It is the most emotionally engaging, stimulating thing in the world for me. Mm hmm. I would love to see Anna Boleyn like that, but at the same time, I'd probably rather be watching a different film with an orchestra live. To kind of loop in the other former elements of the film, I think part of why we're talking about even the desire for an orchestral score that has a sweep is mm. because the film is, I mean, it's not Loves the Pharaoh, but it's very ambitious. Yes. In terms of its production design, like Kurt Richter is doing some lovely stuff. Oh. You have the classic crowd scenes that Lubitsch is doing all over the place in this period. Again, loves the, I mean, I still am like, I, I like the ones in Loves the Feral are goofier. Yeah. <laughs> in, in this one, you have some lovely big compositions where, again, typical Lubitsch of the period, large groups of people are arranged into large geometric formations. <laughs> yep. Yep. The costumes are lovely. I love all the costumes. As a part of this season, I've been really delving into the history of cinematography at this moment. And you can see the classic V lighting that Theodore Sparkle does, which is lights arranged in a V formation on the left and right of the camera. Mm. And the side effects of the open air studios, like you have the most well-lit cathedral in history. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very obviously outdoors and it's just a single wall. Yeah. Which, again, it doesn't play like a real cathedral, but that's not part of the contract of realism that existed at the time. Yeah. So I found all that very exciting. Absolutely. And again, I mean, to do the film credit, there must have been hundreds of carpenters erecting these sets for Anna Boleyn. And they are extraordinary. And I have to say, given that not that many years previously, when you've got big historical epics, particularly the ones coming from Italy, where sometimes you can still see the sets wobbling mm -hmm. because they're only canvas sheets spread out over wood. There's a bit of that in Carmen. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you think, okay, well, the sets have heft. Even if the drama doesn't have heft, you can believe that these are real walls, beautifully textured with the tinting and everything. It has such a lovely textural quality, the images. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking also that the exterior scenes are very nice as well. It's beautiful when they're out in the woods and there's various things going on in the foreground and flirtations and threats and all the rest of it. And I was just looking at the trees in the background. I think this looks lovely. There's very little that pleases me more in life than watching beautifully lit trees tinted in silent cinema. Uh -huh. And it's interesting as well that when most people think of German silent cinema, they would tend to think of the later stuff from the 20s where it's all in a studio and it looks unbelievably well lit and designed and everything else and it's a film with shadows mm -hmm. and it's just an extraordinary world being created but you're in Neubabelsberg or somewhere you know you've not left the studio but you've made a world and so it is nice still I think to see German films of this period where you are still outside and you go okay yes we're outside we still have trees in Germany it's not just dark streets and interiors it's this whole kind of beautiful landscape I always enjoy seeing that and so even if my attention was kind of lost from the drama at points, I was still looking at the back. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice hat, the nice trees. You know, there's all this lovely bush. I particularly should say where both Henry, Anna and the Jester end up in the bush. And I think, what a beautifully lit bush. That's lovely exterior lighting. Uh, yeah. But it looks particularly on the lovely Blu-ray. The foliage pops. It's got such a lovely sharpness to it. It's lovely. So even just as an artifact of this bit of lovely light on this lovely day in time, a hundred plus years ago, there are still lots of pleasures to be had. And Lubitsch clearly, he gets the best out of what he's got. He gets the best out of his carpenters. Everything looks lovely. Mm -hmm. You can reach out and feel the costumes and the sets. And again, at the end of it, I think, well, this was lovely, but wouldn't it be nice if all of this had been used for a slightly more interesting story? Mm -hmm. Again, it's the raw matter of this film is fantastic. But it just lacks that certain something to make me love it and, you know, to want to rewatch it more than every 10 years or however it's been since I last saw it. It's interesting the way that Lubitsch responds to his critics, even in those little details of construction. Uh -huh. Because speaking of carpentry, compare the waiting chamber for Anna Boleyn's execution. Compare that to the one in Madden Dubarry, where there was an American publication that criticized that scene for saying American films would not so obviously have just painted flats. Uh -huh. And then in this film, they're very, very convincing flats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least they have that stucco texture that looks like hewn concrete. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was interesting. And again, it's Lewitt doing the very best he can within these limits. Mm -hmm. And you think this is someone absolutely excelling in a format which he should be abandoning and doing something else with. Yeah. His journey to this peak, but he's climbed the wrong hill. 
He's at the summit, but you should be climbing that mountain over there. You should be <laughs> climbing the romantic comedy mountain, not this bloated historical epic. <laughs> Quick, go over there. Go to Hollywood. It is interesting how, I don't know if you've seen Rosita recently, but the sudden change, mm. like suddenly Rosita happens and he's a master of tone. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful. There are so many artists going from Europe to Hollywood who had a really bad time and who, by the end of the 20s, were wrecks, retreating back to Europe, having been utterly disillusioned. It's nice to see someone who made the right moves. Mm -hmm. They got to their absolute peak of technical, damn it, I can make a good film, technically. And then they're given the right milieu to work, and then they're given the right scripts, and then they really hit their stride. There's that line Lubitsch has where, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, how many times can you direct thousands of people? (laughs) Where at that time he was downsizing. His final Berlin film, The Flamme, is very, very small scale, at least mm. as evidenced by what's left of it. Yeah. And again, was it like 15 minutes worth? It looks beautiful and lovely lighting and sets and everything. Mm-hmm. Again, I have to say, even the 15 minutes, I wish Polo Negri was not having to be melodramatic. I wish she was able to be funny, which I feel like she's truly great at. Because at this point, he had two registers, basically. Mm. He had body and melodramatic. Yeah, It's one of those two where I think he was much better at body, Mm. even a lesser comedy like Romeo and Juliet in the Snow. I really love. I think it's quite good. Yeah. Not to mention the great films of this period. But, you know, as soon as he's in Hollywood, he likes to do neither. Yeah. (laughs) He becomes, I think, I mean, I still think the marriage circle is the point at which I'm like, yes, this is the template that he's going to play in for the rest of his life. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember I showed a clip from that back in teaching days. It's the scene where he's doing the stretches and it's just the morning routine. And it's just, yeah, yeah. You understand absolutely everything about these characters and their lives, just from these beautiful little details. This is so sophisticated, so clever, so witty, so humorous, so gentle as well, so non judgmental. It's perfect. But I mean, this is only a year and a bit after Love of the Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. It's extraordinary that you go from that world to this world. It's wonderful. I'm thinking, what's his last film that I love before that? And it's either The Wildcat or The Doll. Mm. I love The Wildcat to bits, but I also think it has some big flaws. At the same time, I'm like, what works in that? He's so good at these almost maximalist, I've been using the phrase birthday cake expressionism. (laughs) (laughs) And suddenly it turns out he's incredible at giving characters inner lives finally. Yes. Because this is one thing I wanted to mention for Anna Boleyn is that I never get a sense that Boleyn or even really Henry VIII have identifiable inner lives. Yeah that go deeper and run on a different wavelength than what were shown in their physical performances. Yes. That is a problem, I think. Absolutely. Particularly Henny Porton, I think. She's sad and she's worried and she's frightened and she's doing her best. But beyond that, nothing. Mm -hmm. And even Emil Jannings, Henry VIII has appetites. Yeah. And you see his appetites and you see his habits, all the raw materials of a fully rounded character, but there's nothing beyond those appetites. Mm -hmm. The appetites are wonderful to watch being performed, enacted. I was scrolling through the timeline of the film just to get some frame grabs and like throwing a brick into a crowded area. Wherever you land, there'll be a close-up of Emil Yannings with his eyebrows raised and his cheeks puffed out, gurning. Yeah. And it's just, I do love watching Emil Yannings. He is so watchable, even when he's not doing much more than posturing, but he postures so well. (laughs) (laughs) But again, Henry VIII, there is no arc to his story, his character across the film. He starts off Henry VIII, he finishes Henry VIII. Yeah. He's not changed one bit. He's not learned anything. <laughs> I mean, fine. Henry VIII, historically, maybe, didn't have a particularly interesting character arc. A larger than life character who liked women and food and wine. That's how he spent his life until he died of food and wine. <laughs> this era of English history is not exactly my forte nor my central interest in life. But I know enough about Henry VIII to know that there was a lot of really interesting politicking going on at this point. Yeah. And I kind of want the film to be about him as a politician. Mm. That to me is the most interesting way in. I want a film about the founding of the Anglican Church. Uh, That's what (laughs) I want. I don't think we're on the wrong character because I think, yes, you can make Annabelle interesting, but yeah, this film just doesn't. It's one of the dimensions that it closes off for itself. You see historical events happen and everything is correct and as it should be. Mm -hmm. It's almost another limitation that the film puts on itself that you don't get more of that. It's as if the film thinks it's enough that it's just about this relationship going wrong, effectively. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough. And you're crying out for something extra to be added, whether it's the political dimension or whether it's Anna's character, or, you know, just something extra to give it more. Because after the hour point in the film, and again, it's a long film, it's essentially two hours, there's nothing more that the drama does with its own characters or story after that hour point. 
from that point on, it's ticking boxes of what will happen and it will happen. Yeah. And even the character of Lady Jane, when she turns up and she's clearly the next in line, she's a very simplified character. It's just, okay, so instead of making Anna even vaguely politically savvy, you've just got, okay, here is the politically savvy woman in this film. Mm Mm-hmm right from the get-go she's kind of scheming conniving and her performance almost you think okay well if this were a comedy film you would make that character the female equivalent of emma yennings you would make her character big and humorous and exaggerated yeah the film doesn't quite i mean they flirt in a very nicely matched kind of ott way but the character's not got that many scenes and she doesn't have that much to do so again it's another opportunity which is briefly raised and then discarded Mm. it's a shame I didn't rewatch this other film for the sake of this podcast, but I thought about it a lot because my other favourite Henry VIII on screen is Sid James in Carry On Henry from 1960, whatever it was. Mm. And I've no idea if the Carry On films have penetrated North America enough for you to have seen any of them. I have not, no. There's no particular reason why you should, but for anyone listening who is not British, essentially, a series of sort of sex comedies essentially made between the late 50s and, oh my God, when did the end? I think they ended in the 80s originally, when all the cast was still alive and too old for the films that are being placed. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them were send-ups of British history. And so Carry On Henry has Sid James, who was this wonderful comic actor. And that film starts with one wife being beheaded and him immediately going and marrying the other. So that starts in exactly the same way as the opera from Donizetti, Anna Boleyn, ends. Mm. And he's fantastically entertaining and everything is lyricus and there's lots of puns about breasts and all the It's everything you want in crude, end-of-the-peer postcard humour. And I was thinking that film at least has many of the same characters as which is Anna Boleyn, but it goes in a completely different direction and does more with the material it has in a weird way. Not to say that Carry On Henry is in the same league of quality in any way as which is Anna Boleyn, but at least it engages with the material in a way that works to its own advantage. Mm-hmm. Whereas Anna Boleyn is sort of too well-mannered towards its material in some ways. It treats it so nicely that it doesn't dare be original particularly. At the end of it, you feel, okay, well, that was a very well-made historical drama. Thank you. Exactly. It's a button down film from a director who we don't necessarily love for his button downness. Exactly. Watching Cole Heisel's Daughters. Even seeing Yannings and Porton paired in the same year as this film was made. Yes. Having such fun and just zinging off each other. I think if you'd made Anna Boleyn as a sex comedy, as a farce, it would have been infinitely more entertaining and you would have got more out of it. And even the character of Liesl, who gets 20 minutes of screen time total in that movie. Yeah. She's one of two characters Porton plays. She's a way more interesting character. Yeah. Way more interesting than Anna Boleyn, who gets a lion's share of this film's two-hour runtime, which drags. The characters in that film are also likewise defined by appetites in a way, Mm -hmm. but they do have inner lives, I think. Yeah. You actually get to see them progress. There's subtext. Liesl has suppressed desires. Yes. That only come out progressively as she encounters her match in the wonderfully play-acting, abusive (laughs) Emil Yannings. So clearly, Lubitsch could do it, but it had to be kind of finessed beyond this. I'm so glad I went from Anna Boleyn, actually, to watch the other film. For the sake of, you know, I have to see these people playing opposite each other again. And it's as if all of the fun that they didn't have in the one film was poured into the other film. You think, okay, this is a film almost exactly half the length. Mm -hmm. It's only an hour long, and it's got everything going for it in terms of fun and action. It's such a delightful film. Yeah. And Anna Boleyn is an impressive film. It is, and that's the damning phrase, a historically interesting film. (laughs) It's of academic intrigue. Exactly. It's of historical interest in the way that so many things that are very worthy are of interest, but you don't want to sit down and rewatch it anytime soon. Are there any other elements to Anna Boleyn that you'd be remiss not to mention? Only, I suppose, perhaps to mention Paul Beansfeldt, who plays the jester, just because I've seen him now as sidekick or minor character in various Lubitsch films. Mm Mm-hmm. He's one of the few things that I felt in Love to the Pharaoh could have been a bit more developed. The slightly campy arch sidekick to the Pharaoh, who was his advisor, thinking, well, there's something there, but it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see him actually also in Romeo and Juliet in the Snow, having his own albeit moderate role of power when he is, I think he plays the local judge and he gets his scene and he gets to taste the sausages to see who will win the court case. (laughs) One of my favorite moments is in the film is when the judge will withdraw. And so he goes and he takes the two sausages and he bites out of one. And before he's even finished chewing or swallowed it, he's put the other one in his mouth. So there's no way you can begin to distinguish the difference. Yeah. So it's nice to see him get a little cameo. And I think as the jester in Annabelle, he has a small amount of fun. And it's nice to see him, but more even could be made of the jester character. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've wrung the film dry now for comments. <laughs> if I'm talking about, you know, I wish the jester had a bit more time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. 
Next week, Paul Cuff again joins us to discuss Napoleon? Yes, you heard it right, folks. We're doing Abel Gantz's 1927 epic, Napoleon. Because why not? It's my podcast. Deal with it. Gloria Mercer was our dialogue editor for this episode. Head over to www.ernstcast.com for links to the various public domain films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes. How Would Lupage Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast service you happen to use. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. 